All of the safety regulations and laws that we have are written in their blood. This does not look like coal that I know. These cars are the biggest thing that fits in there. Shiny. Any leader that doesn't have a regret about something is probably not being honest. And where's it going? That's the million dollar question. This is almost like the race to the moon. Don't give up on us yet. Just please don't throw us away. We are not Democrats or Republicans or conservatives or liberals for the next couple hours. We are people who come here to petition our government to do what's right. I love my job. I'm actually getting paid to travel around and raise hell about something. I don't know where you get a job like that. <laughs> we traveled south in Appalachia to Triangle, Virginia, where we met with Cecil Roberts, the president of the United Mine Workers of America, the powerful labor union that has been representing coal miners for over 130 years. I always look at these pictures and I say, they're going, they dress better than we do. <laughs> so much history. Oh, this is more like a museum. Oh, this is a tragedy that uh, this occurred just a few weeks after 9-11 uh, down oh. in Alabama. We pumped water into the mine to put out the fire and keep it from exploding again. So I had to go down to the local hall and tell the families that we couldn't get the other 12 out yet. I said, we're going to lose the mine rescue team if we send them back in there. And boy, it was hard. My mom and dad lived right, right there. Is their house still there? Yeah, my sister lives in it now. Here, I'll show you my favorite picture of me right here. So I'm like staring. <laughs> <laughs> directly in the eyes of the cop and the U.S. Marshals serving us. I don't know how many times I got arrested here, but I just, I've lost count. You've worn the hard hat and you, you also worn the suit. How does it affect you personally, understanding both sides? I'm a coal miner first. My father was a coal miner. Both my grandfathers were killed in the mines. I never had the chance to meet them. My family made their way here from Wales. They were miners before they came here. They were miners in Wales? Oh, yes. Once you're a coal miner, every ounce of you is driven by what you know about mining coal. What defines a coal miner? You have to have a certain amount of courage to go underground. I can tell you my first day in the mine, I was scared to death, and I had been in Vietnam in a war. I worked in a, what they call a drift mine. You went straight back in the mountain. The uh, miner that signed for me, he said, son, don't raise up. You'll get your head torn off. And I went, say what? <laughs> my heart went and then we stop, and I'm like, how do you walk in here? I'm hitting my head, I'm hitting my back, I'm falling down. And these guys they have been in the mines 25, 30 years. They're just like they were walking on the street, just all been over like this. It's a little like being in a war zone mm -hmm. because everybody looks after everybody else. I read someone saying these are dirty power plants when they're talking about coal or dirty jobs. I wonder how much these words make a difference in the perception people have about um, coal mining. So many people look down their nose at us, right? And let's face it, for a hundred years, we've allowed this country, we've generated cheap electricity so people up on Wall Street can run their computers. People all over the United States can have power. Quite frankly, we've done work that they wouldn't dare to do in order for that to happen. And you've sacrificed a lot more than we, just Yes, there's the time been about 115, 120,000 coal miners lose their lives mining coal in this country, not to mention the fact that about 180,000 people have died from pneumoconiosis. And people say, now right there's the reason you need to do away with coal mining. No, right there's the reason 100 years ago this country should have made the mines safer. It was the UMWA that made these mines safer. Do you think if we were doing coal mining in California, that we'd be talking about shutting down this industry? Well, of course not. There's too many votes. Or New York. Of course not. But if you look at Appalachia with a limited amount of votes... Politics over people sometimes. Oh, absolutely. Do you know why so many coal miners are uh, unemployed right now? Because we gave the steel industry away to China. Now, who, who made that decision? I enjoyed talking politics with Cecil for about an hour. 
That's part of his job, but we try to keep it out of our show. Did you foresee any of this coming? And based on what you've learned, can you imagine where it's going? There's actually technology that's in the, being developed not to just take uh, uh, carbon from the burning of coal or burning or production of steel, but to suck it out of the air itself. Can you imagine that? It's like a vacuum. This is almost like the race to the moon. People want to develop this technology because that's the wave of the future. As sure as you and I are talking, it's going to happen. And what does it actually mean when it happens? What is the impact? What, what it means is that you could have a coal-fired power plant that's emitting uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and warms the planet that would remove that. I would put more faith in carbon capture than gigantic batteries that are going to allow us to have enough electricity in this country. I just hope that we don't take steps here to put a lot more coal miners out of work, a lot more steel workers out of work, a lot more manufacturing workers out of work before we give this technology a chance. I kept thinking about where to draw the line between Cecil's story, his work, and the politics of energy. These days, it seems impossible to tell a story of a coal miner without being considered political. So in the end, I decided just to sit back to enjoy the person and the conversation. For a period of time, people have thought that natural gas just didn't have a future. Right? And then all of a sudden, we, dis we discover new technology. And so we now have an abundance of natural gas. Fracking and, right through. Yes, mm -hmm. my hope is that we put as much faith in technology for the utilization of coal as we're putting our blind faith in renewables. And if we do that, I think coal certainly has a future. There's a percentage of people in this country that have devoted their life to shutting down every coal-fired power plant in the United States. I mean, I find it interesting that there are actually people who have a job to put other people out of work. <laughs> I never thought about it that way. <laughs> I mean, they see, okay, I'm saving the planet, so these coal miners are just going to have to be unemployed. These communities are just going to have to be devastated. Instead of paying people in, in China to make uh, these wind turbines, let's, let's bring those factories to the United States, particularly in the hardest hit areas of Appalachia. And the people in Appalachia have already paid a huge price here with the loss of their jobs. Let's give them some hope. Every time there was tragedy, pray for the dead, fight like hell for the living. That's our chore today. That's our challenge today, delegates. Pray for the dead, but we got to fight like hell for everybody else when we leave this convention. Any regrets? Any regrets about what? In your role. Any leader that doesn't have a regret about something that uh, then is probably not being honest. I've won more elections than um, anybody in the uh, history of our union. Mm -hmm. That means that there's trust between you and the workers and you should never do anything ever to validate that trust. And I, I know I'm getting closer to the end than I am to the beginning of this, but I'm, when I leave, I hope people think that he did all he could to help us. Mm. And you believe you have? I do. Uh, there are some things I might do differently if I had a chance, but those are few and far between. In a world all their own, these great men stride. Their courage they show, their fear they hide. Although it's special, it's hard to understand the real true life of a coal mining man. John Rice, 1978. These coal miners reminded me just how much I take electricity for granted. But what I learned most from them is that it's gratitude toward each other and reverence toward their past that gives them the courage to face the unknown underground and the unknowns of the future. The beautiful hills of Appalachia, from Pennsylvania to Alabama, are rich with coal and coal mining history. But as outsiders to the industry and the coal culture, we had trouble finding many of the sites. Now it's, it's not even a dot on a road map, now. You can see them and you can touch them, if you can find them. 
because they no longer exist on any maps. We do find all kinds of different things down there. It, it, you know, it can be a lot of fun. Every day I was going somewhere that no man had ever been before. I thank my buddy every time I see him because I swear to God I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for him. Do you think people have given up hope? I don't think they've gave up hope. We don't, we don't ever give up. I appreciate your positivity. <laughs> we are going to go into the number nine coal mine. Your hat says, I love explosives. Yes. Is that right? We are 1,600 feet in, a little over a quarter of a mile, and we are 190 feet underground. Wow. I feel really cold. You don't feel cold? You get used to it. When you see a vein of coal, you're seeing something that hasn't been on the surface in 300 million years. What does this mean to you as a miner yourself? What do you think of when you see this? All of the safety regulations and laws that we have today are written in their blood. I'm a very firm believer the minute that you forget where you came from, you're going to go back there again.